Because I, I, I get the notion that um, there, there's some confusion over a few things, and I don't want to go over new stuff while we're still working on other stuff. So how about this? If you do have a laptop and you want to bring it in, and um, you, you want to um, ask me questions about your program, why it works. Well, you're not going to ask me why it works. You're going to ask me why it doesn't work, right? Maybe you'll ask me why it works. I mean, I've had times where I've written something that's like, why does that work? But usually I don't worry about that too long, all right? Um, but we'll use Thursday as a review slash questions day. So bring your laptop, don't bring your laptop, you know. Um, if you don't have questions, which I can't imagine any of you not having questions, but hey, if you don't have, you, you don't, you know, you, you could you could not come or just come for part of it or whatever. Um, but if, if we run out of questions for me to field and to answer, um, then uh, the rest of the time will just be a work time. You know, you can show me what you have and all that. I did grade lab two um, uh, right before I came here. Um, and so you should have a grade for lab two. Um, the one thing that I, I do in some of my classes is it's sometimes called a one minute paper where you write down the one thing that you are most clear about and the one thing that you find is most confusing. All right, and that will, and, and we'll do that on Thursday. That will be the start out of our class. Um, in fact, we might start out with that uh, at the end of class today. We'll see how today's lecture goes because there's two things I want to cover today and when I'm done with those then um, if there's time we can we can do the clear versus fuzzy. And that'll give me some idea of what to uh, discuss. At any rate, the two things I want to talk about are I'm going to talk more about inflating layouts because that is confusing as heck. All right. Don't mind telling you that. And I, I, I'm going to try doing it a different way. All right? Maybe a different way. Because uh, I, I think I might understand why it's so confusing. All right? So we'll give that a shot. The other thing I want to do is I want to talk about your next lab assignment and how it relates to that and maybe sketch out what you need to do in code. As far as a Twitter example goes, um, I'm only going to go over that one method, the method that does the inflating. The rest of it, look at it if you want, don't look at it if you don't want, but we're just going to focus on that one because that, that's, the, that's the important part of that application uh, for me. All right, I did, by the way, import the Twitter application in Android Studio, and that went without a hitch. Um, so it could very well be. The problems that I ran into when I was grading your stuff is if you had a different SDK set than me, I would have to download and install that. So one of the things you might want to look at is when you download and if you, if you were to download uh, like a, a sample application from somewhere or Deedle's examples and you try to import it into Android Studio, it'll probably tell you, one of the things it might tell you is that it can't find SDK, blah, whatever in which case you have to go and download it and, and that. You had a question or a comment? Do you have to download a lot of them? No, it's like one. Like, like I, it was like I had part of 23 or something like that and I had to like download the rest of it. And it, it was, yeah, it was, uh, it was, was pretty, pretty trivial. Uh, didn't, didn't take that much time. Plus I have a pretty fast internet connection at home so it went, you know, kind of like that. All right, let's look. In fact, let's go and do that with the favorite Twitter searches. Yeah, so I'm going to go into import, import, and there it is, Twitter searches. I'm going to import it. I just take the defaults. It goes and does its thing. It's giving me an error right now because of the way something is configured, but if I go and build the app, I 
It thinks about it for a while. It asks me to choose a running device. And the thing I've noticed, at least on my machine, is if I get the emulator up, I am never going to close this window again for the rest of my life. All right? Because then it happens. Each subsequent time happens pretty quickly. So really, the, the what do I want to say? The, the big performance hit comes the very first time you open up the emulator. So now, I, now that given that the emulator was up, you, you, I think you saw it before when I fired it up, um, I can just go to there, and it does not take long at all to go and do its thing. And to you guys' point, notice that you do have trouble accessing the size. Um, oops. Um, I forget how to make this stupid thing smaller. I swear I accidentally did it one day, just like I like moved my fingers a certain way and it scrunched it. So <laughs> uh, we will put it. Oh, I don't want to make. There we go. We'll do that for now. And um, put it on the right. And it still makes it full screen. Um, I don't know if changing the uh, resolution of the monitor maybe would just make it bigger. Now you can, when you create this, you can specify the type of device it is. So you could try creating a smaller device and that might help as well. But again, we're in shape. I can type in my query here. Give a tag to it. Hit save. And there it goes and adds it to the list. Now that's the interesting part of this application for me. The fact that this GUI is dynamic. So I go in here and put something else in. Originally, there were zero buttons in there. All right. Now there is one button in there, or, or one set of buttons in there. Um, now there's going to be two sets of buttons in there, and so on. So that's the part of this that's interesting for me, and that's the part that's relevant for your next assignment. So I'm going to bring up the code. And I wonder if I can make the code bigger in this. I'm not sure I want it to look like Eclipse. Right? I want I want I want bigger bigger fine. Oh well, I'll do, I'll do like I have been doing, just copying it in the text set in case that's hard to read. All right, before we look at the code though, I'm going to try to draw on the, on the, on the I'm going to actually use the whiteboard, because that doesn't give you a lot of room to operate. So I'm going to actually use the whiteboard, and we are going to look at I want something where it's not going to project anything. So I put it on VCR or something. So if I hit, if I accidentally bump play and we have like a 70s educational video about something, you'll know what's going on. All right. So the one thought I had is the one thing that's confusing about this is when I talk about the button. I'm talking about actually a bunch of different stuff. All right. 
So actually, that's not going to work. It's not going to record it. That's what I want. But then I don't want this. Right. Let's try this. I'll write on this section of the board. I'll just move the camera over that way. All right, there we go. When I talk about the button, I could be talking about four different things, let's say. Depends how you score it, but three or four different things. There's the button that exists in the layout file. All right? The XML uh, file that contains a description of the layout. In there, there's a button tag. All right? So I could mean that when I'm talking about the button. I could mean the button thing that is actually physically on the screen, the thing that the user actually presses. I could be talking about the button object that lives in memory, or I could be talking about my variable that points to the button object. All right? So let's talk about this whole thing of how this works. All right? And let's start out just by talking about the main layout. All right? Because I'm interested in two things in this example. I'm interested in the table that's part of the main layout. And I'm interested in each row in that table, which consists of a couple of buttons. So I have two layouts. Main XML. And I forget exactly what it's called, but the new XML. And the main XML has a scrollable control. Again, I might be getting the precise wording of this wrong. And that contains a table. And the idea of this is when the table gets bigger than the screen, it's going to be scrollable, so we can scroll back and forth to it, right? Because unlike the other GUIs um, that we've seen so far, um, this one expands. So this one could expand beyond the, the page. So that's in the main XML. All right? These are our resource files. We then have our code. And then we have think of how to draw this. I have the code. This is a computer's memory. And this is the actual screen. So before this program starts, this is what we have. We have our code that's sitting here, memory, nothing about the tables in memory, the screen is blank. Then we fire up our application. Let's look at the code that happens when we fire up our application. The code that fires up at the start of the application, all right, we're not interested in this line. This is the line we're interested in. All right, and you can't see it, but here we go. That's the line we're interested in. Set content view, our layout main. What does that do? All right. That takes this main XML file. Draws those controls on the screen. All right? And sets, creates objects that correspond to this in memory. So all these objects 
are put in the main content view for our activity. This is an activity, right? So when we say set contact content view, we are creating the main content view for that activity. So we have objects for all the little things in our XML, including that table. All right? So what did that? The statement that says set content view. What does that do? That reads this resource file, puts those things on the screen, and creates objects in memory that are, that are our code's representation of those things, okay? Because our code has to be able to reference these things on the screen. It does it by referencing the corresponding object in memory. You know, these two go hand in hand. If I change it here, I'm going to change it on the screen, okay? So, that's what happens, and this has been happening since day one. For day one, our activities have had the main content all right, and we have that line that says set content view, and what that did is that took our resource file and brought it to life. Instead of just an XML file, we have actually live objects that are hooked to, that are connected to the actual stuff on the screen. So here's our table, and it starts out with zero rows. Nothing in it. All right. Let's go back to code. That's the instruction that did it. Set content view r.layout.main. Okay. So, when we click the button, remember, all these things happen, and the method that we're interested in is make tab. GUI. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. There's one more thing I wanted to show. This line here. Query table layout equals table layout find view by ID r dot ID dot query table layout. Now, when you see find view by ID, where is it looking for that view? It's looking for that view somewhere. Where is it looking for the view? Uh, it's looking for it in the main content view. The activity's main content view. And you're right. You're right in the sense that, yeah, that came originally from the XML file. But it's not like it's reading the XML file. It's looking for the content view. And you're right in the sense that, yeah, it's looking for it anywhere in the whole screen. All right? Anywhere the view that has that ID. But it's looking in because there's nothing that precedes this. <coughs> it's looking for that thing that has an ID of query table layout in the main content view. And this is the view that has the ID of query table layout. So we now have a variable, query table layout, that points to that object in memory. And oh yeah, by the way, it points to that object on the screen as well. Because remember, those two are linked. You change it here, you're changing it there. All right? So how did I know that is looking in the main content view or anywhere because there's nothing before find view by ID. So the assumption is, is that I'm looking for it in the main content view. So now I have my XML file is sort of out of the picture now, right? It did its job. It was used to create those objects in memory and the corresponding physical things on the screen. All right? And we used code to point to the query table layout. And we do use code to point to everything on the screen, right? The buttons, the this, the that, and so on. But we're only interested in this table. All right? So 
That's how it's worked, and that's how the, the applications have worked since day one. But now we're getting into dynamic GUI, where we are going to add a variable number of things to this table. So that's why we have another XML file. And if we look, that XML file is called newtagview.xml. So I just have new up here, but it's new tag view.xml. And it consists of a table row and a couple of buttons. All right, so that's what's in the table row, the, the new tag view XML. It's a table row that consists of some buttons. Pardon me? Do you still have to declare a layout inside of that? No. Because this isn't an entire, um, this isn't an entire layout. It's a part of the layout. It's the incremental part. So whatever it is we're adding is going to be in there. We're going to add it to a layout. We're going to add it to a table layout. But it doesn't itself need a layout. Okay. And here is that XML file. All right, so we press save on our emulator. I type in something new. And click save. What I'm going to focus on is the GUI part of this, because that's the part that I want to make sure that you understand from this. So I click Save. What happens? Well, the following things happen. Some other things happen too, but eventually this make tag GUI gets called. And it gets called with two things. The string of the tag, all right, so remember I put in the description and the tag, and the index. One of the things this application does is it alphabetizes the um, tag, so it puts them in alphabetic order. So we don't, and this is one nice thing about modularized programming. I don't care how it gets to this point, all right? Yeah, that's important, and we could study that, and there's things that we could learn. But if I'm just interested in this method, I can just trust, well, hey, the index is where I want to put it in the table, and the tag is the tag that I want to put in the table. And if I'm changing this code, if, for example, it was putting it in the wrong position, and I needed to correct that, I wouldn't have to worry about the rest of it. I could just look at this function, because that's what this function's job is. All right. First thing we notice is it creates a layout inflator object. The layout inflator object is what takes that XML file and actually makes real objects out of it. All right? Now, this line here says view new tag view equals inflator inflate our layout new tag view, all right, what does that do? In my code,
I'm using a built-in Android utility, which is a layout inflator. I'm going to call a method on it. That's going to read this XML and effectively bring it to life as objects in memory. All right? That's what inflating is. This is just a description. This is a recipe for some objects. The layout inflator takes that recipe, takes that XML file, and brings it to life in the form of a new view object. So this is my new view object, which is named new tag view. So I have my variable called new tag view that gets set to a pointer to this guy. So new tag view is that view that got inflated and turned in from a description of a layout to an actual layout. Now what is in that view? Well, there's a table row in that view. Everything that's in the XML. Table row, a button, another button, and a checkbox. And they all have their appropriate IDs. All right. The, we'll look at the one button to start. It's called new tag button. So this button has an ID of new tag button. This, notice that this is a little different than that first thing we did, right? Because the first thing we did created the objects in memory and also put them on the screen. This just, this inflation just created the objects in memory, but we haven't put it on anywhere on the screen yet. So that view is floating out here in memory until we say, go and put, go in and put yourself on the main GUI somewhere. So, new tag view is my pointer to this guy in memory. So let's look at the code. View new tag view inflate. What's the inflator do? It takes the XML layout and actually creates that view object in memory. And, additionally, it points the variable named new tag view to that object. So new tag view points to that object that's in memory. What is that object? It's a view. All right, that's what inflators create. They inflate XML to make views out of it. Specifically, in our case, it's a table row view that contains a couple of buttons and a checkbox. All right. So at this point, what do we have? We have that new tag view object sitting in memory. The variable new tag view points to it. And now we want to point to the views that are inside of that view. Because we have to do a couple things, right? We have to put on the button the name of the tag. So we have to manipulate that. We have to assign an on-click listener to that button. All right? And so on. So we need to be able to point to that button just like we needed to point to the table that was in the main content view. So I have these statements. Button, new tag button equals button. All right, this is a line of statements we saw since the beginning of class, except we no longer have new tag view, or we no longer have simply find view by ID. We have new tag view dot find view by ID. So what's the difference between this line and the other line? Well, remember, if I simply say find view by ID, I'm looking in the main content view for that activity. If I say view 
new tag view dot find view by ID. I'm not looking for it anywhere on the screen, as the student mentioned. I'm looking at it strictly within that view. So I say new tag button equals button ta new tag view find view by ID r dot ID new tag button. What that will do is that will point new tag button it's going to look in this view for the thing called new tag button okay here it is now this variable points to that button in memory so it's the same operation we did before but we're looking for these views in different places we're looking for these views not in the main content view but in the new view, the one that we just inflated. That right now is just sitting in memory. All right, it's not on our screen yet. Then what do we do? Well, a couple things. We set the text of that to the argument that we were given. We set the on click listener of that, right? Now that we have a pointer to that button, we can do button things to it, right? Anything you can do a button, we can do to that. And what do we typically do with buttons? Well, we set listeners to them and we set the value of their text. So that's what we do here. We do the exact same thing with the edit button. All right, we find it using its ID and we set the on click listener. So now we have set those two buttons, we have pointed to their proper listeners. All right, and we're ready for the last step. And what's the last step? The last step is query table layout, add view, new tag view, and we give it an index. The index for a table is simply what row we want to put it at. All right? And um, remember, like in your assignments, I don't think you need to worry about the row you put it in. You can just always add to the end of, of the, the layout. But in this case, they did need to worry about the row. Now, let's look and see what that does. Query table layout, what is that again? That's query table layout, which points to this table, or this guy on the screen. We're going to add a view. What view are we going to add? We're going to add the new tag view, this guy here. So what we do then in that final step is we take this object that we prepped in memory and set all the things about it and we go and add it. We call the add view method to add that view to the method or to the table. So now we have a table that has one row and that row consists of two buttons and a checkbox. Now the question was raised last time, these all have the same ID. They do. The reason why that's okay is we're only ever going to be looking at one row at a time. All right. Every operation we do to go and type in a new uh, um, Twitter search and a new tag and click save, we're inserting one new row. So we're only going to have one new tag button in this view that we're interested in. All right, we're not going to be dealing with two rows that have that. We're only going to be looking at that one brand new row, and therefore we can use the same ID. Yes? So say you have three rows, you'll have six buttons. Yes. Do you technically have two listeners or six? We actually have two listeners. Each of these, and we can, we'll take a second to look at that, even though that wasn't the main part of this. Um, I think it's important uh, to do that. Um, because we actually have, you know, this gets assigned a listener, this gets assigned a listener. If we have a second row, this gets the same listener as this, this gets the same listener as this. Well, how does the code know which button got clicked? Well, we can take a look at that, all right, in a, in a second. All right, so let's look at that now. How does a button know, how does the, the listener know, rather, which button got clicked?
All right, this is the query button listener. It knows because the view, all right, the specific view that got clicked gets passed in to this method, the onclick method. If you remember when we created this in the first class that we created the onclick uh, uh, method or uh, uh, an onclick listener, we created the method and we passed it a view. The view tells it what specifically got clicked. And what specifically got clicked, we're grabbing the text of and we're finding the query that corresponds to that tag. So, in other words, yes, every query button, every search button that we press has the same listener, but that listener is smart enough to know which button got clicked, grab the text from that, use that to grab a string that contains save searches, the, the, the string that goes along with that. So for example, um, if I click this button, all right, the view that gets passed to this, the on-click button, is going to be this button. I grab the text for that button. The text is A. A is used to look up, gee, what is the search that corresponds to the tag A? It was Android development, and then it runs out and does that search. So it takes the text from the button and uses that into this save searches element, which contains the tag, or it contains the query term that's associated with the tag. All right? So in a nutshell, that's how it works. We know which one got clicked because we get passed in the view, and therefore we can do tests with it. Yes. That's the wrong button. I think you want this one. That's just the button listener? This is the query button listener. That's the listener for... The on click only applies to the buttons because it's in the query button listener and not the checkbox. Correct. We don't have a listener assigned to the checkbox. Okay. And again, we actually have two listeners, right? We have a listener for this button and then a listener for this button. And this button does kind of the same thing. It knows what button got clicked. It gets the parent from, it gets the parent of the button that got clicked, in other words, the table row. It grabs then the value of that and it looks in. Um, to get the actual tag, and then it goes and um, sets the two text boxes and lets, um, lets them enter it, or, or edit it, rather. So in a nutshell, that's the idea of a dynamic GUI. We have our shell GUI, that's the main GUI that gets set as a content view as soon as we fire up the application. We point to the piece of that GUI that we're going to expand, that we're going to add stuff to. In this case, it was that query table. We have XML for the new piece that we're going to add whenever we take an action, like when we click a button. All right. In this case, since we're adding to a table, it's a table row. All right. We can inflate that table row using the new XML layout, and we then have a table row view in memory. We can then find things within that view by putting in the view name dot get view by ID instead of just plain old get view by ID or find view by ID. Then finally, when everything is done, we can go and take that new view that we created in memory and say, go and add this view to our main GUI. In this case, we point it to the table. We're going to add that onto the table. All right? So the thing that I find that is a little confusing is when you're talking about the button, you have to understand that, that the button sort of exists in a couple of different places, right? It is described in the XML, it gets created in memory, 
and manipulate it in memory. And then the row gets assigned to the table so that button then appears on the screen. So depending on what you're talking about, what you mean by the button could actually be a couple of different things. All right? and, and I think that's sort of the confusing part. But if you remember that process, inflate creates the objects in memory. We can then find objects within that new view and manipulate them. And then we can add that view to an existing view, the screen. Um, that's how we create the dynamic view. Questions? It's a complicated statement, but the good thing is you just copy it, right? That, that's not, that never changes. That would not change now. I, would, I, I, I won't say never, but typically that, that will always be this. Is layout and player service capitalized because it's a constant? Yes. So, we grab our inflator machine and then we use that inflator machine to actually inflate that layout, bring it to life, and put a pointer to the new view we created into new tag view. We can then find the different sub views using find view by ID, but we're not looking at the content view, we're looking at the new view we created. That's static method. Is what a static method? Uh, layout inflator, is that static? Is what static about it? Uh, it's very, uh, it's about number format why you didn't use the term new. Yes. No. No. Well, we're not, we don't use the word new because there's already a system service object created. Oh, okay. And we're just grabbing a pointer to. So that's why we don't say new. We're not making a new one. Yes? That is a good question. Let's Google it. I can create a view and add it to another view in one step simply by putting in the, this is the view group so I could put in another view and I could inflate that create the view and automatically add it to the table for example alright so if I were to put in this In fact, let's go and let's go and do that. I could, when I create the view, automatically add it to, to query table layout. All right. Oh. When I create the view, 
and do the inflate and create that view object, I could automatically add it to the query table layout. Then I wouldn't need this instruction down here. All right. Why do you suppose I'm not doing that in this case? Not necessarily. <laughs> for instruction, for that's always a possibility too, but no. I'm doing it because I don't just want to add it. I want to add it in a certain place. Remember, we add it in, we add to the table in a certain position because we alphabetize this. This would probably just put it as the last thing. All right, so let's go and run this and see if I am right. Because I say index, right? That index is used to say I want to put it in a certain position. One of the earlier methods determines where to put it, and then now I go and I add that table row into a certain position. So I'll type in AAA, type in something here. Click save. All right. There's a bug in the code, but it looks like it just added it to the top of that. So yeah, the null says, that to answer your original question, the null is that represents the object that I want to add this view to. So I can make a view and add it to a view in one statement. We did that here in two statements. I made the object up here, I did some things to it, and then here I go and set the view. Or add it to the view. Other questions about this? All right, um, it's about, let's see, 10 after. So we should have time to do at least one of the two other things that we could do today. Um, let me pull, let me talk, uh, pull of the next assignment. If you understand everything and you don't really have any questions, Thursday come and be prepared to discuss how you do this example. You don't have to have the code or anything, but. All right, here's the assignment. I think I forgot that. Download the pizza classes in the week five module. We'll do that in a second. Create a UI that will allow the user to choose the size of pizza, whether that's pepperoni or not, and a button to add the pizza to the order. The UI should allow a scrollable list of all pizzas ordered. When a pizza is added to the order, show, show the total amount of the order and the total baking time. For an extra challenge, add the ability to delete a pizza. Okay, so we'll look at the pizza classes in a second. All right. Your UI is going to look like this. We're a very simplistic pizza shop. You can order small, medium, and large, and you can have pepperoni or not. That's the only, it's the only choices you have. You know, you want something, you know, you want another top and go somewhere else, you know, forget that. So this is what we want the GUI to look like. And this will be fairly similar to the GUI that you have with, with Twitter search. There will be a tech, uh, uh, maybe, well, could be a spinner control. This says the size, small, medium, and large. There could be a checkbox that says, do you want pepperoni? And there's going to be a save button. All right. When you click save, it should add to a list 
small pepperoni. You pick, let's say, a large plane, and it will just say large. And so on down the line. It should also show you how long, or how much the, the order costs. And it should show you how long it takes to bake it. All right, we'll assume this is like an entry system for a pizza place. Where they can take orders and it'll tell them how long it's going to take to bake. Now, one thing I've noticed in this class is people come into this class with a variety of backgrounds as far as object-oriented code goes. All right? So what I'm doing in this example is I'm giving you the code for the order and for the pizza. You just have to focus on the android -y kind of thing. That is hooking up my classes to your uh, GUI. So, I have in the week five module two classes. You can ignore anything that ends in a dot class. So you can get rid of that. You can ignore the unit test Java. That makes it easier to ignore now, doesn't it? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> uh, pardon me? What I, what I did after I downloaded it, and again, I went to, oh shoot, I went to week five and it was pizza classes. When you extract the zip file, you get these six files. You can delete the classes, the dot class. That's the compiled code. You can also get rid of the unit test class. The two that you're interested in are the order and the pizza class. Now here's a good thing. It'd be great if you understand how this works. But if you don't understand everything about how it works, if you know how to use these classes, that'll be okay. All right. The order class is the one that you're going to be interacting with, as well as the pizza class. When they click on, let's say, small pepperoni, you will create a new pizza object. You'll set the size to small. You'll set pepperoni to true. And then you'll call the add to order method to add the pizza to the order. After you've done that, you can call the order's calc cost method and calc baking time method to tell you how, long it, how much it's going to cost and how long it's going to take to bake. For sure, if you want to take the time to read through these classes and get an understanding of how they work, I'll be glad to help you. But at the very least, um, some developers create objects for other people to use. Other programmers use the objects that others have created. All right? And in this case, the pizza and the order object has already been created for you. All you need to do is use it and call the appropriate methods. And I can work with you on, on doing that as well. All right. So what I'd like to do for Thursday is this is how this is how Thursday is going to run. All right. The first part of class, I am uh, going to probably ask you 
Well, let's rewind. I'll come in and I will discuss the things that you said are confusing and I'll try to answer your questions. So we'll start with the Q&A session. All right. After that, one of two things will happen. If you're still working on assignments and you don't have assignments complete and, and you have questions about that, I'll be happy to address you if you bring your laptop or even bring in printouts of your code or the files. I can load up the files on my machine and help you if you don't have a laptop. If there are no, none of those questions, or if I address those questions, then I will discuss with anyone that wants to in more details about how to code this. All right? I want to make sure that we have an understanding, and I don't want to give too uh, difficult of assignments. All right? So we can take our time working through this assignment um, and, and make sure that we get it right. Okay. Yes. For the homework, do you want to credit? Huh? All we do is basically copy our string file and for a, a localized version and change the values to another language. Yes. And put it in an appropriate form. How do you force test that? Is there something we can set? Yeah. Um. Yeah, set the language on your phone. Or if you have the emulator. You can go to options. Settings, where is that? Um, sure. Settings. Go into language and import. And now great, mine's in a language that I have no idea what it says. But we better put it back in English. Yeah, that's true. All right, so yeah, that's in a nutshell what you do, and put it in a resource folder that's appropriately named. All right, what I'd like you to do is to, for the next 10 minutes, take a minute and think of one thing that you think is clear and one thing that you find confusing. Now, believe me, there's no judging on my part. If the thing you find clear is that you use Android Studio to develop code, that's fine. Seriously, I'm not going to judge anyone for that. It, it is what it is, right? We want to use a starting point to branch off. The fuzzy thing, if there is a lot of things you're having trouble with, just pick one, all right? So take a minute and think of the thing that's clearest to you in this class the thing that is fuzziest to you in this class, and then we'll go forward. Yes? Could I put up some of what Android code?
All right, we have any volunteers? Clear is something that's clear, yes. Uh, clear. Uh, Sanctuary views. Okay. Fuzzy. The uh, object associated with the first table. So variables that point to views. Is that correct? Yes, and I think what's fuzzy is the generic view object. Well, well, well I, I'm, I'm actually, I'm behind you. I'm, I'm talking about the clear part, right? What you are, you said that the variables that point to views yes. is something that's clear. Yes. Okay, what's fuzzy? The generic view object, I think it might just be the variable thing for a view, the query table layout. Okay. Who wants to go next? I gotta show. I gotta show you something from Facebook yesterday because everyone is going to answer the actual code. The <coughs> code logic. All right. And the code is, is quite clear. It's pretty similar to that. It's pretty concise. Mm -hmm. Awesome. What's fuzzy is the, the overall thought process, but, uh, like what to do next. Like you just explained adding the new table row, mm -hmm. but you, you, you would send it to a button that wasn't there yet. In my mind, I would make the button and then do all that. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, I just don't know where to start and where, you know, I know we're finished. I don't know how to, how to sort out my thoughts. Okay. Uh, to give a quick answer for this, and remember, we're gonna we're gonna revisit this next time. I'm going to to, to uh, um, bring that back, but um, that button is there. It's just not in the screen. Right. It's it's out in memory. So that button does exist. It's just not visible. Yet. So when we inflated the XML, that made the button. So we don't have to make the button. Inflating the XML did. And I'll be glad to go over this more. So, for example, making button. We had a second for the code logic, right? Yes. And in what, anyone, anyone else volunteered something fuzzy? I have a hard time understanding, like, say, I know something possible, but what do I use to make that, like, what, uh, the open parameter? Right. Specific parameters to do something. Okay, I'm going to get this list down and we can talk about details of some of this. Anyone else? We have a couple more people, three more people. Um, was he kind of where you're coming in with a job where you have two classes? I guess it's going to go along with the pizza thing. From the main, right? calling code in different classes. And again, this will be important like when we do the pizza one and all that. And something that's clear? Rings. Rings. Okay. All right. A couple more? Uh, for clear? Huh? Uh, setting variables to like elements, like uh, views and stuff, that's easy for me. Okay. Uh, setting strings as well, uh, but fuzzy, setting up like tables, that's kind of a mystery to me. <laughs> All right. And lastly, go ahead. Um, fuzzy, making my layout pretty. <laughs> uh, yep. Pretty layouts. And something clear? Maybe making layouts that aren't don't look so good. <laughs> well, I can I can make the layout just fine. Right. Because uh, like I made the, the converter, it's just that when I was doing the grid thing, I expected that well, maybe I'd be able to control the size of the grids. So I'd like to make it look more like a tip calculator. Right. Like how everything had nice squares and it was laid yeah. out pretty nicely. I put stuff in there, and it's auto assigning 
strength to things and I don't gotcha. know how to change those. Okay. I don't know if it's, if there's an easy way to just do it when you're in man hours so it doesn't automatically right. like with uh, like visual. Right. Or if there's something where you just have to go into it and you have to modify things to sidebar and it's like I imagine it's not as much of a nightmare. You really need a table view for that assignment. Yeah. You could just put it right, on. right, right. Yeah. Now, what was up in Square? Um, making the layout, like oh, making the layout. Uh, okay. Assigning, and like we've said, like assigning app values to things. Right. Um, making a string table. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Just to make, go back into like the flow start and finish. Um, making C sharp in your Java class, everything's nice and pretty with the code. Android seems like a royal mess. There's any way to disorganize, it seems to me, too, kind of a little bit. Is there any way to organize the code better, or...? What do you mean by organize the code better? Like, is there, is there a system, I guess, what it seems like is... Get it off the screen so we don't see it after we're done with it, maybe? Until you know... What? You, you, oh, yeah, no, you like turn your laptop same, off. You know, same same right your on-click method. You're yes. done with it. You don't want to see it anymore. It's a pain in the butt to go through. Or in general, is there um? Do you mean like like maybe a, a collapsible thing? Yeah, yeah. class or yeah. that would help. Yeah. There's, there's, there's a mess out there. You know what I'm talking about with their Java apps. It's nice and easy to read. Mm -hmm. You got so much going on in the screen at once. You it can. is kind of intense, like there's a lot. Yeah, you can collapse like this. Like that refresh buttons. If I don't want to see that refresh buttons, I can collapse that method. I can collapse that method. So anywhere I got like the uh, anywhere you have the little brackets, I think you can collapse. Or at least the methods. I guess a fuzzy would be the IE itself. Okay. With Android Studio, and right. learning how to use it more appropriately or effectively. Fair enough. Okay, well I have to show you this, because you guys are very good in answering when I ask for feedback. If every once in a while you get one of those classes that people just ain't gonna say a word, you know? And my daughter posted this picture and I said like, you can tell the more versus less experienced teachers. The less experienced teachers cave after about 10 seconds of silence. Whereas the most experienced uh, teachers will just sit there until someone answers, and they don't care. But anyhow, every teacher makes the I'll wait face. So I have my own I'll wait face, I think. So um, yeah, he's pretty experienced, as you can see. He's waiting a long time for his answer. Um, all right. Um, so we clear on what we are doing Thursday. We will use this as a starting point. Bring any other questions that you have. And then the remainder of time, we will spend, you will work on your labs or we can discuss future labs. Yes? I have a question for everyone. Do that, do that work on Friday? Who's using Android Studio? Did you guys have get the homework done on Friday? For which, which one, the crazy convert? Uh, yeah, with the image. Yeah, yeah, the image, yeah. Did you put, did you put it in drawables or did you put it in drawables? Oh, okay, yeah. sure. Put it in drawables. You got it in drawables? Yeah. I had to make new drawable folders. Yeah, you got to make, right, you got to make new folders. And then you have to make And you got to pull it off where you got to save it and then pull it from your yeah. computer, throw it in there. That was easy. I, I, I couldn't figure out how to get this dynamically changed. I looked yeah. it up for like three hours and yeah. finally found the method. So what it does, right, it prints a drawable. And then it has subfolder drawable, yeah. this, this, and this. Yeah. You have to put them.